season two, Netflix Unsolved Mysteries. I'm getting around to it. Again, I had a lot going on lately. Uh, so I finally got to it. First episode, wow, uh, John Wheeler. Uh, this is a uh, this is a tricky one, you know. Uh, but I think if you look at it logically uh, and put the pieces together and not get so drawn up into um, you know maybe conspiracy theories because he worked uh, as a presidential aide and worked for the Department of Defense, I think we can logically take all these possibilities and deduce it to probabilities. So uh, while I was watching it, I, you know, I took down a couple notes. Um, you know, some of the first things that struck me was that he had his ring on, you know, and that was early in their episode they said that, and then at the end of the episode they went on to explain how he had some cash in his pocket too, which would indicate that it was probably not a robbery. Uh, Harvard and Yale educated. I mean, this guy was smart, okay? Um, not only was he very highly educated, but uh, also a vet, so props to him. You know, I was in the Marine Corps, uh, so, you know, respect for that. Vietnam vet, you know, these are things that you would learn through his victimology. And again, that's where you always want to start. You always want to start at what type of person was this guy? Um, and when you do that, you find out a lot of things, okay? From the Again, please understand this, because sometimes in these comments you guys say, well, you didn't investigate that. No shit! I'm not investigating anything. This is just a reaction from watching the episode. I'm going off of what's there. You know, if I was investigating it, I would have watched it. Then I would go into the research phase, and I would learn everything I could about the case, get the police files get the uh, autopsy report, interview people, get surveillance footage, all the stuff that they, the police officers and investigators already have done, uh, but that's what you do when you investigate. This is not an investigation. This is my reaction to what I saw on that episode. So one of the things that stuck out to me again is, is bipolarness. Okay, they mentioned that quite a few, and you would learn that through victimology. When you first start the investigation, uh, that's what you would do. Tell me more about this guy. Now, him working for the Department of Defense at this uh, MITRE Corporation, I will grant that that draws some red flags. And some of the things that happened, um, you immediately want to shift to this was a professional hit. I think kind of that's where the daughter was going you know when she was talking she certainly said she did not believe that it was random I'm gonna tell you why I don't believe it was a professional hit uh, and I'll tell you you know what I think more than likely happened but uh, he was found at a landfill which was I believe six miles away from where he was last seen uh, I could be wrong on that could be six miles from where he lived. I believe he lived in Newcastle, um, but they found him in a landfill in Newark. So there were some discrepancies there. Let's just jump right to uh, the meat and potatoes of this. Is It appears when they found um, Mr. Wheeler's body at the landfill, it appears that at the same time, police were going to his house for an unrelated burglary that had just occurred. Now, normally, I, I don't believe in coincidences, okay? This guy's body's found, and at the same time, they receive a call, and they're on their way to his home for a burglary. What had happened is a neighbor was noticing, I believe he said a second floor window was open. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, because um, this was in December. His body was found December 31st. So that second floor window being open is disturbing. Because, uh, and I'll get to that later too and tell you why I think that. But they come in and they showed the evidence photos. You know, there was Comet on the floor. You know, the Comet, the detergent, the powder, 
stuff was knocked over. The front door, the screen door was shut, but the door behind it, the actual main door, was ajar. Um, and it looked like there was a struggle there. One of the things that stuck out to me was that in that comet there was a footprint. But that footprint was barefoot. Somebody wasn't wearing a shoe. So that tells me that that was not the burglar, if there was a burglary that happened. That's somebody from inside the home. Victimology would tell you whether that John Wheeler or his guest took off their shoes before they come into the house. Because if they did, you could say, I mean, there's multiple reasonings. You could say, okay, well, Mr. Wheeler was sleeping and he heard a burglary and he came down in and uh, he interrupted it and that was his prints in the comet, but he didn't report, report the burglary. You know, I guess he had sent an email saying that his badge from the Department of Defense, the MITRE Corporation, was stolen along with maybe his cell phone and they sub subsequently they find his cell phone across the street at a house that was being built where had some smoke bombs were set off earlier I mean this this case has a lot of different directions okay but stick with me on this hopefully you watch the episode because that's the only way you'll know what I'm talking about if you didn't watch it well you're probably thinking whoa this is going all over the place but the case is all over the place uh, he was having a dispute, Mr. Wheeler was, with the people across the street from him about building this house. Some smoke bombs were set off, and when they went to investigate that, they found his cell phone. So that leads me to believe that one of two things. Either there was a burglary at the home, and he, they took his cell phone in this burglary, and somehow, when they were making their exit across the street, uh, the cell phone was either lost or discarded. I don't buy that. Um, let's get to the surveillance footage that they found of Mr. Wheeler. Okay, this burglary happened, if I'm not mistaken, a couple days prior to him being seen. So... We can rule out that the burglary, that he saw something during the burglary and he was killed there and placed in the landfill. We can rule that out because surveillance footage puts him at different places after the burglary happened. You follow me? So, what we can say is that he was not acting rationally in some of these surveillance videos. The first that we see him, he's visiting a pharmacy, okay? And during this pharmacy visit, he seems okay. You can tell by his body language, he's talking. But what I find odd was that he was asking for a ride to a garage that has his car, uh, a parking garage. Victimology, again, will tell you, is this normal? Apparently, from the episode, it is normal for him to misplace his vehicle. Is it normal for him to get rides from strangers? That's what I'm getting at. I mean, I, maybe it's just me. I would not go to a pharmacy and just start trying to solicit rides somewhere from people I don't know to get my car. Granted, he had lost his cell phone, it appears, uh, by this time. So that means... He didn't, but you could use a pay phone. You could ask the pharmacy if you could use their phone. You could tell the pharmacy to call you a cab, whatever it is. So, is he acting normal in that pharmacy? Uh, according to the episode, he is, but I'm not so sure. What we do know is the next surveillance video of him, he is not acting rationally. He's carrying his shoe, okay? And he's walking around. Apparently, the person who dropped him off at the garage would be somebody I'd want to talk to, obviously, but surveillance video shows that he got dropped off at a garage where his car wasn't. His car was blocks away. He was in the wrong garage. 
and you can see him pointing at the attendant, carrying his shoe, uh, the reporter on there. Now, he's saying well, it looks like he's hiding from somebody, peeking around the corner. I didn't see that, okay? To me, it looks like somebody that's having a psychotic episode. He's bipolar um, or somebody that is very pissed off, very distressed, very upset maybe that number one, he lost his cell phone and now he lost his car and he's getting frustrated. Doesn't explain to me why he's carrying his shoe. Okay, that, that bothers me. It takes two seconds to put your shoe back on. Instead, you're gonna carry it around. To me, that's something mental that is uh, taking place. And again, he's diagnosed, I believe, with bipolar. If not, at least his family has said on the episode that he was bipolar. Um, let's see what else do I have written down here. Oh, something that I noticed. <clears throat> it appears that he was in that garage like he was limping. And I thought maybe that was because he, his shoe you know, was off. So he kind of looked like he was off balance. But then when I looked at the pharmacy video previous to the surveillance video of the garage, he, he was limping there too. So I guess I couldn't put too much stock into that. Uh, I don't know if victimology, again, I keep saying how important victimology is. That answers a lot of questions, you know, mysteries. Is victimology, getting to know that victim better than they know themselves. You know, did he have a limp? Well, if the answer at during victimology is yes, well, then it has nothing to do with nothing. Uh, but I did notice that and I wrote it down. Um, I already said I kind of disagree with that reporter that it looked like he was trying to hide for something. And something else that he did, if you, the one of the last videos of him being alive, okay, after this parking garage incident and he can't find his car, he goes into not an abandoned building, but it's a building um, and it appears that he spends the night there. That is a little irrational, I believe, especially he had money on him, okay, when they found his body. Wouldn't a rational person go and get a hotel room if they couldn't make it home because they can't find their car? Or use that money to get a cab to go home, to sleep in their own bed? For him to sleep, as they said, possibly in a stairwell overnight, that's irrational, okay? That, that's not a rational person's thought. But then what he does next, I think seals the case. He's seen walking out on surveillance video out of this building with a hoodie. He didn't have a change of clothes. One of the things that they showed was there was a fitness gym or something within that building and with lockers. I believe he stole that hoodie and put it on because he was going Obviously, he exited the building in December. It was December 30th, 31st, and he was going out into the cold. And he was had enough wherewithal to know what he was wearing isn't going to cut it out there in the cold. So maybe he planned on walking a good distance, um, but he stole a sweatshirt. To me, that's somebody that, again, not thinking rationally, but also kind of desperate. Um, so that, that stuck out to me, and that was key. Um, one of the witnesses said that they saw him get into a cab. I think it was 11 o'clock at night, and they weren't, investigators said, well, we're not sure whether that person actually saw Mr. Wheeler or if it was somebody else. Well, get the records, get the cab dispatch, you know, in, in the Zodiac case, I mean, that's what we looked at with the Paul Stein killing in San Francisco, you know, is there a, a dispatch? You might not have called dispatch, so they weren't there, but if they're flagged down and annotated in the logbook or whatever. So 
I mean, that, that should give you a lead right there. I'm sure that they did that. And I know how TV works. Sometimes they don't show things and they make it more dramatic than what it is. I get that. Trust me, I get that more than most people do. Uh, but anyhow, that's uh, my suggestion. But it all comes down to me, I, I don't believe it was a professional hit. You know, they indicated that it was somebody trying to get rid of a body. The reporter uh, says that, well, if it's a random street bugging, they're going to shoot him, kill him, and leave him lay right there. They're not going to put him in the dumpster. That's not necessarily true. Uh, you don't know what people are going to do. If it was a hit, they're just going to shoot him. From the autopsy report, at least on the show, there was no indication of that, that, they, that he was shot and killed. Now, could he have been tortured? Yes. Now, some of you people in the comment section, you're going to say that. Well, he was, it was a conspiracy theory, and they were trying to get information from him, and they beat him, and that's why from here up, the family was allowed to see him, but here down, you know, they went to work on his legs or whatever it was. He had broken ribs. My question for that, number one, is I'd want to know that, does that truck, that garbage truck, have a compactor? Could that explain the injuries? Now, I'm sure that the medical examiner and the police have thought of all this, but, I, but they don't address it on the show, and that's why I'm bringing it up. Um, he, could he have been sleeping in that dumpster? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the daughter, she's adamant saying no way. Uh, and no disrespect to her because she's been through enough. I, I know that. But here, you're looking at the evidence of everything. You're seeing somebody that is not acting rationally, who put on a sweatshirt, stole a sweatshirt. So, I mean, you cannot say it's inconceivable for him to not, you know, to have gotten into a dumpster to sleep. And then it's an accident. You know, if, I don't think he's going to die and suffer those injuries just from the dumpster being lifted up and dumped in. To the back of a truck but if it compacts certainly um, i'm not saying that it's an accident i'm saying that that is a possibility and it's a strong possibility but it's not a hit okay it, it's not a professional hit um and i'll tell you another reason why it's not a professional hit is because he was lost he's roaming around how are these people that it's a professional hit are just going to find them? And are they following them? You know, okay, let's go through a conspiracy theorist thought. Well, they, they broke into his house and then they followed him and to this building and waited for the opportune time to kill him. And then they did. Then they put him in the dumpster and stole his briefcase. They had plenty of time to kill him in that building where he spent the night in a stairwell. Think about that. A stairwell in the middle of the night. Um, who's to say that that didn't happen? I'm, I'm not. But I'm saying if, if that was the case, if he got beat to death there in that stairwell, yes, they probably would have left him in that stairwell then tracking him from that building all the way to where he was found. That makes zero sense. Okay? Just like a lot of things in this case, it doesn't make sense. But if you start rationalizing it and putting it in sequential order, um, I think it, you can find out, at least you can start eliminating things like it was a professional hit, because it wasn't. At least, let me clarify this, from what I saw, if there was more evidence that isn't, wasn't shown on the episode, then maybe I would change my mind. But right now, I'm not seeing that at all. I'm seeing a guy that's in distress, a guy that's, that's having a bit of a mental break, okay? It's a, it's a mental break that he's having. Um, I'd want to know more about his medications and you, how much medicine did they find at his house? Um, did it show that he hadn't been taking it for a while? This is, so, you know, so many questions, but... The bottom line is, okay, you're asking, okay, Kenny, uh, you know, you're supposed to be this great cool case expert and this and that. Tell me what happened. Well, I can't without, 
you know, some certainty, um, some trepidation, but I can say that more than likely, this is what I think happened. I think that he went over there to set those smoke bombs um, in some sort of, he was starting to lose a little bit of grip with reality and his anger and his manic, uh, um, not depression, he was just manic. And he went over there and set those smoke bombs and when he did, he lost his cell phone. And he probably was using, you know, the light on his cell phone to see maybe and turned it off so he wasn't being seen. And after they went up, you know, maybe he had trouble finding his way out of the house because he doesn't want to use his flashlight on this cell phone. So he trips, he falls, whatever happens. And is that why he got that limp that we're seeing in the surveillance videos? Because he fell in that house after he set the smoke bombs and his cell phone fell and he lost it. So now he goes back into his house and he can't find his cell phone and his whole life is that cell phone. And he's just beside himself. So then he sends his email saying, hey, my house was broken into and they took this and they took that. And maybe that was all made up and none of that happened. And he's just covering for a small crime of setting those smoke bombs. But that sets in, you know, the events that happened. And he is the one that destroyed that house because of the bare footprint in that comment. That tells me that it was somebody from inside that house. It wasn't an outsider. So he destroys that house for two reasons. Looking for his cell phone, number one, and number two, being angry, you know, that he lost it. And he probably knew that he lost it across the street or, or whatever it was, and he just couldn't, he couldn't find it. Um, and he's not taking his medication, and it leads to the events that we see where he either went to sleep in this dumpster, and if it was a compact unit, he was crushed, and that killed him. Um, or he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, wandering these streets at night. You know, I don't know what those streets are like. Uh, I don't know if it's like a Baltimore or Detroit where the crime rate is a little bit more elevated than it is in other cities. And, you know, he looked like an easy target, an older gentleman, and two, you know, people put the boots to him. You know, but again, it doesn't make sense because nothing was stolen from him. He still had the money. He still had that West Point ring on. Uh, you know, so I don't know. But there, there's a lot of things that could happen that you don't know about. He could have been walking across the street and got hit by a car. And it would explain all the injuries below the waist and the fractured ribs and stuff. And the guy was drunk. Three in the morning, businessman, and in a panic, he looks to his left and he sees a dumpster. He goes over there and throws him in the dumpster. Is that probable? No, probably not, but it's possible. But what we can do is we can deduce that it wasn't a hit, and we can deduce that the burglary at the house was not actual burglary. It was John Wheeler. Uh, being frantic, looking for his cell phone, and being angry. And the onset, I believe, of a bipolar or some other medical condition that made him uh, lose grip on reality a little bit. So, hey, that, that's my thoughts on episode one of season two of Unsolved Mysteries. Great show. Again, they're doing such a great job. And so... Stay tuned. I, I'm going to keep doing these now that I'm settled into my, my new digs here. And uh, I hope you like them. And I'm getting a lot of great feedback from people that want me to keep doing these. And uh, I will. And there will be some other mysteries that I look at. And uh, just stay tuned for all that stuff. And, you know, thank you very much. And uh, everyone have a good day.